You just can't ask the physician, are you any good at what you do? Who's going to say, no, I suck? Hey guys, James saying, ooh, just got done with a, well, it was a stimmy, it was a false alarm stimmy, but, so I wanted to talk to you today about if you're the patient and you're going to have a heart catheterization, there are some things that you should know about having a heart catheterization. So like, if I need to get my car fixed, I don't know anything about getting my car fixed, and there's things I wish I did know. So if you're the patient and you're going to have a heart catheterization, let's go into the cath lab and uh, get some of the important information covered. So today's video is about, uh, really for the patient, um, some things you might want to think about if you're having a left heart catheterization. So I have a video for what is a left heart catheterization, uh, and I'll, I'll leave a link right here for what's a left heart catheterization. But Here's some questions that you might want to ask, uh, investigate. So number one is, it, is your cath going to be done as an inpatient or an outpatient? Now, if you've come to the hospital because you had chest pain, you're going to be done most likely as an inpatient. Your choices are a little more limited because things may be done uh, urgently or emergently. But if you're having a cath, if you've been having chest pain, the physician says, you know, we, we, you did a stress test that was questionable, maybe you had a CTA, and said, now you want to have a heart catheterization. So the first question, are you, is this being done as an inpatient or an outpatient? Okay. If you're being done as an outpatient, that means you come from home to a facility, get your IV started, get worked up, have your heart cath, and most likely go home the same day. So some questions that you're going to ask, where is this going to be done? Is this going to be done at the hospital or is it going to be done at a doctor's office? Now, for the, the purpose of doing a heart catheterization, one is to see if there's any blockages that need to be fixed. So if you did not know this, some cardiologists are diagnostic physicians only, meaning they can take the pictures, but they can't fix anything. Okay, So you want to know, is the physician an interventionist? If you find a problem, can you go ahead and fix it right here, right now? I've worked in a cath lab. I've worked in three different cath labs. I've been a nurse for 40 plus years, a lot of various ICU. I've worked in the industry and I currently work in a cath lab. So I have worked in a cath lab, one cath lab where the physician was diagnostic only. And, and, and none of us really like that because if it turns, if it's some, somebody needs to be fixed the way it's supposed to be, it's like, well, you have your backup, you found something that needs to be fixed, your partner will come then and there and fix it. But that's just not the way it turned out a lot of times. I don't know how it is at every institution across America, but oftentimes it would be like, well, we're, we, you had your heart catheterization, we're going to take you off the table, you're coming back later today or you're coming back tomorrow to have an intervention. So from your point of view, you're going through everything twice. Um, another question to ask, some, if this is being done in the hospital, some hospitals, uh, the, the cath labs are diagnostic cath labs only, meaning that cath lab they don't fix. If they find something that needs to be fixed on you, you are sent to another hospital. Typically, you know, something in the same hospital system, typically to the to the, uh, the mothership, the big hospital of the system. And so that's a huge thing. Why would some people do this? And I did work at one cath lab. I went there to transition them from a diagnostic, or to help, wasn't just me, to help transition from a diagnostic only to an interventional lab. And the physicians would explain it to the patient, well, you're here at the hospital. This hospital does diagnostic heart catheterizations only. If you want to be done by somebody that, if we find a blockage, we can fix it by the doctor and the hospital does that procedure, we have to transfer you to the main hospital. Their schedule's full. It's going to take a couple of, you're going to be here two more days before you can transfer over and have your heart catheterization. So we can do your heart cath today, and if it come, turns out normal, you'll probably go home today. So you run into that situation. So one can the physician that's doing your procedure, can he do an intervention if something needs to be done? And two, the hospital that you're at, does that hospital's cath lab, do they do interventions in that cath lab? The next question, if you're being done as an outpatient, is are you being done in the hospital? 
something that started uh, this year is that some physicians are doing interventions in their office. So their office, they have a cath lab attached to the physician's office. I, I've never worked in that, that kind of lab, so I don't have any experience with that. I, I guess, like if you knew you weren't going to have any problems, then it's probably a great place to go. The problem is, if you have a problem or a complication, like when you're in the hospital, like where I am now, if we have to call a rapid response, if we have to call a code, there are not, well, some hospitals, there's hundreds and hundreds of people um, to respond to an emergency, to respond to the rapid response, to respond to the code. In a doctor's office, how many employees, you know, that are nurses or PAs or physicians? Oh, four, five, six. So occasionally things go wrong when you have a heart catheterization. Most of the time, no, things don't go wrong. So most of the time, it's probably okay to have a heart catheterization and an intervention at a doctor's office. I, that's just a judgment part. I, I, I don't know. I'd rather be in the hospital if something goes, certainly if something goes wrong, but then you think, well, nothing's going to go wrong. So that's something to think about. I, you know, I guess another aspect, I have known some of my coworkers have left and they've gone to work at at di physician's offices where they have, at that time, it's just diagnostic lab only. So when you're in the hospital, oftentimes the physicians, they want the latest and greatest. I want the best medication. I want the best drugs. I want the best devices. I want the best of everything because the hospital's paying for it. When you go to the doctor's office, well, now they have to pay for everything. So maybe they don't have the latest and greatest. It will vary from office to office. But it's, it's kind of like you want the latest and greatest that somebody else is paying for it. But if you're at a physician's office, he's, he's paying for everything from the lights to the stents to the balloons. Some things may be there on consignment, but people have a tendency to be a little more frugal when they're paying for it themselves. Another thing to think about if you're going to have your procedure done at a doctor's office. And I guess my analogy to that is like I have always worked at a not-for-profit hospital. I don't want to work at a for-profit hospital. I've had some friends that work at for-profit hospitals like HCA. I don't, I've never worked at an HCA, but HCA hospital, for-profit. And sometimes the nurses that work there, and it's not just the cath lab, it's just the hospital in general. The for-profit hospitals answer to shareholders. They need to make money. Don't get me wrong, not-for-profit hospitals. They want to make money, too. They just reinvest it back into the hospital, and they're answering to the community. I've had some friends that work at for-profit hospitals. It's like, they can't even get some of the basic supplies. And like, I get two wash racks per patient. I can't clean up a patient. I only have two wash racks. They run short of supplies sometimes because, I, you know, hospitals, it, they, they pinch pennies. And that's just my personal opinion. They're pinching pennies at a for-profit hospital. The focus is on the wrong thing. Every hospital I've worked at has been not for profit, and honestly, the focus is on the patient. Okay. Additionally, now you you won't you won't have this choice, um, but you want to know: Is the physician going to do a radial approach for your heart catheterization, a possible intervention, or is he doing femoral from the groin? Uh, so why would people do two different approaches? Well, back in the 80s when all this started, everything was done femoral from the groin. And for 20 years or so, that's the way everything was done. There's a whole lot of tools, a whole lot of different shaped catheters. There's a whole lot of things available to do your heart cath from the groin. And then people, th there's complications going from the groin. Sometimes people have a higher bleeding rate as opposed to the radial approach. And usually it's right radial. Um, an American heart, you know, this is not from me. I, yes, I worked in cath. I can tell you the complication rate's lower going from a radio. Uh, people bleed more from the groin. So why is that and why is it a problem? Okay, so when you have your heart catheterization, the doctor's going to poke a hole in your artery on purpose to get in your body to do what he's going to do. And then when you get done, you have to take that catheter out and you're either going to hold pressure to make that hole clot off or you're going to use some type of closure device 
to close off that hole. Sometimes people in doctor's offices, they have a tendency they don't want to use any closure devices. They just want to hold manual pressure. And manual pressure is a gold standard. You're not inserting anything into the body. There's no foreign object. Um, so what's the problem with femoral? Well, they, they can bleed two times as much as, as the radial approach. The radial approach, more often the complication is radial artery occlusion. But you have an ulnar artery. Um, I mean, you don't want to have a complication from either side. So why is the groin more prone to having complications? Whatever artery has a hole poked into it, you need to immobilize that artery for a few hours post-procedure. When you go through the groin, I'm sorry, when you go through the, the radial artery, we put this hard plastic band, blow up a little inflatable uh, in, insert air in this inflatable pillow, and it holds pressure. It's very easy to put a, a bracelet around your wrist and have pressure on there. And it's very easy to immobilize the wrist. Put a board on the hand. You might say, well, everybody, most people are right-handed. That's kind of inconvenient. Yes, but well, you can still use your left hand. You can still use your fingers. It's this stuff. When you get up, don't push up out of bed. Don't pick up anything heavy. That's what we're trying to avoid. You could still use your fingers. You could still be on your phone. Uh, you could be on the computer when you go home. Um, but you got to take it easy post-procedure. Uh, as opposed to the femoral artery, if you got to keep your groin that angle straight, that means you can't sit up. That means you can't bend your leg up. You've got to keep the groin artery, the femoral artery straight. If you didn't know, there's an epidemic across America that uh, like everybody over, over the age of 50 has back problems. I mean, not everybody. I'm exaggerating. But there's so many people that can't lay flat. Okay, it hurts their back tremendously to lay flat. And the way you relieve pressure is that you either bend your legs to relieve pressure on your lower back or you sit up to relieve pressure on your lower back. Well, that's exactly what you don't want to do on the femoral artery. You don't want to bend it and make the clot break loose. Now, some people say, well, we're going to use a closure device. And I have no problem with some of the closure devices. There are some other closure devices which are horrible, in my personal opinion. It's, there's different kind of closure devices that plug up or suture up the hole that allows you to get up out of bed sooner. So there's some, I don't work for Angus. Angus still is one of the best. It's my personal opinion. Um, it allows the patients to get up sooner. But you do have a foreign object inside the artery that will dissolve over the next 30 days. So it can break loose and it can cause, there's risks and benefits with that as well. So when you do manual compression, there is no closure device for the radial artery. It's so it's, it's just right there under your skin. And why would people bleed more? Because, because post-procedure, nobody minds laying there with their wrist out on a pillow where everybody can observe it. And even if people are overweight, there's usually not a lot of adipose tissue around the wrist. It's very easy to see if there's bleeding. It's very easy to leave this exposed. Your femoral artery, nobody wants to lay there with their groin exposed. They want their gown over it. They want the blankets over it. And most people, not everybody, have a lot of adipose tissue there. So when you bleed, it's usually under the skin. And all that adipose tissue, all that fat can hide it for a while. You have to reach up and palpate and push to see, hey, is there anything getting firm? Is there any blood clot forming under there? So you can have more bleeding that goes unrecognized from the femoral site looking at it visually, and everybody wants to have it covered up. Nobody, I, I wouldn't either. Nobody wants their groin exposed after the procedure. Nobody minds their wrist being exposed after the procedure. So radial is a much better way. Now, so then you say, well, why doesn't the doctor go radial? So it's however they learned, however they have most older physicians, what's well, older, I don't know, they learned femoral approach. And at some point, they may have transitioned to radio. Most younger physicians, they train radio, and that's they're used to doing hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of cases. So while you would prefer a radial approach, the physician needs to be very, very competent at doing a radial approach. You wouldn't want somebody... 
at some point, if there's a physician, if he, if he was trained femoral and he transitioned over to radial, there was a learning curve. And I've worked in a hospital where that happened because I've been, I've been doing this for like 40 years. So I've seen the transition. I've seen people try to learn radial and it, that became like worse for me because they would, they would do radial approach and they couldn't get all the pictures that they wanted. So then they had to go femoral to finish the heart catheterization. And now, I, now you, I had to take care of a patient that had a radial and a femoral sheath. I had to manage two sites. And, and I don't, like, how do you ask that question? Hey, doctor, are you any good at radials? Are you any good? Nobody's going to say, yeah, I'm not very good. I'm, I, I'm not very good at that. But I want to I practice on you. I mean, it's like anything else. You know, there's some nurses that are good. There's some nurses that aren't that good. There's people that fix your car that are good. There's people that fix your There's painters that do it great. There's other painters that are sloppy and splatter. So that's, that's every profession. Some people are better than other people. And how do you ask that? Hey, are you any good at doing hard casts? Are you any good at doing interventions? Are you any good at doing radio? Pro so how do you find out? I don't know. You just have to ask. You have to ask people who know. Like, I... Like, I'm getting my pavers resealed. I know nothing about pavers, but I call and ask around and get quotes. I talk to people. And, like, like I'm a nurse, so I can do stuff like this. Like, one time somebody said, hey, a buddy of mine's having some GI surgery at your hospital. You have two GI doctors. Which one should he use? I don't know much about GI surgery, but I call the GI floor and go, hey, there's Dr. A and Dr. B. Explain the situation. Who should my friend use? Do not use Dr. A, they tell me. His infection rate is horrible. Do not, no matter what. I would take my dog to Dr. A. Okay, I, I can do that as a nurse. I've even, like, somebody one time was one of the OBGYN. I, I, I had zero experience with OBGYN. But being a nurse, I just called. It was, it was the largest hospital in the city. I, hey, operator, transfer me to the OBGYN floor. I don't even know the name of it. Transfer me to the OBGYN floor. Hey, James in the cath lab at whatever hospital I'm at. Can I talk to the charge nurse? Hey, charge nurse, do you literally have two or three minutes? I need to ask you a question. They kinda, if they can talk, it piques their interest. Hey, I have a friend's coming there. They're going to have, they need an OBGYN. Who would you pick for your family? I'm not telling you to bad mouth. I'm just telling you nurse to nurse. Tell me, who would you send your family to? I mean, that's the way I get around that stuff. I don't know. So the public, you just ask people, who, who, what heart doctor do you go to? So one, then what's their bedside manner like? Two, did they do a good result? Three, did things go well? They do the same thing with hospitals. Hey, what's it like at this hospital versus that hospital? So I guess that's the way you find out. You just can't ask the physician, are you any good at what you do? Who's going to say, no, I suck? Um, all right, guys, thanks a lot. If you liked the video, hit the thumbs up. It would help my channel. And if you found the information helpful or useful, consider subscribing to the channel. And if you do, remember to turn on notifications so that you don't miss when the next video comes out. All right, guys, thanks so much. We'll see you in the next video.